So one of the points of the sermon, one of the main points of the sermon is, you know, how we live lives of wholeness, of fullness. And I was just reading a study the other day that said people who give lots of money are happier. So I would like to do an experiment. No, I need a tune. I need that on. So the offer today will now be joyously, happily collected. Make yourselves really, really happy. <laughs> so Dana sent me an email about a month ago asking if I'd like to preach today. I was excited to get the invitation, said yes, but then I saw the theme for the year was relationships. I mean, I know I'm a minister, but I'm still a guy. Do I really have to talk about the <laughs> Now, the sub-theme for the month is integrity. Relationships and integrity. As I thought about this sermon, my thoughts turned to Italy and to high school. I thought of Dante and his journey through hell, purgatory, and finally heaven. He constructed his epic poem, The Divine Comedy, out of a series of circles. Hell has a series of levels reflecting different sins, culminating in his meeting with Lucifer, who is embedded in ice, gnawing on the most damned of all. Purgatorio and Paradiso are likewise a series of circular structures. We'll get back to such orbits a little later. <coughs> So contemplating Dante's genius brought me back to the Latin I studied in high school. Alan Santinon, I can't say that without an accent because he always said it that way, he was an Italian gentleman who was my teacher for Latin. And I was a reasonably good student, but was mostly known for my willingness to wear a toga on Rome night. Because <laughs> that's an image you all need. Anyway, the English word integrity comes from the Latin integritas, to be intact or complete in itself. <coughs> integer, integer, a whole number. So the origin of the word integrity contains a sense of wholeness, of completeness. But what do we mean when we say someone has integrity? Usually we're saying that someone is honest, has high moral standards, is trustworthy. I did the right thing, I told the truth because I didn't want to compromise my integrity. I didn't want to compromise my integrity. It's an interesting concept. I did the right thing because I didn't want to damage my wholeness. To be dishonest is somehow to make ourselves less than complete. I do the right thing because to do otherwise makes me less than whole. When I use the term whole or wholeness, I'm thinking loosely of what the Greek philosophers held as the aim of all life and action, eudaimonia, often translated as happiness, but that really is too narrow a definition. Human well-being or flourishing is better. Though it should be noted that Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and others often held widely divergent views of what that actually looked like in practice. <clears throat> Still, I think we can generally conceive of what I mean. Wholeness is my word for a life that allows one to live fully with what is necessary, physically, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually. In recent years, the study of positive psychology has grown enormously and is dedicated largely to this idea. How does one live a full and gratifying life? In fact, all, almost all of my nonfiction reading these days is from this area. And study after study shows that material goods beyond a relatively modest point brings no increase in happiness. Perfect health with no supportive relationships is of limited use. Intellectual gifts without emotional health 
also falls short, and so on and so on. A good life is one of balance between the head, heart, body, and soul. The good life may be hard to strictly define. I think it's rather like how Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart once described obscenity. I know it when I see it. <laughs> I prefer to think of integrity in terms of wholeness rather than the usual connotations of morality. I prefer the sense of wholeness because it appeals not to the outward adherence to society's expectations, but rather to a deeper sense of justice and reality. Morals change as societies change. Slavery, sexuality, war, women's rights, gay rights, have all had society's negative or positive moral judgment over time. I'd like to think <clears throat> leaders within our own tradition have often listened to a deeper voice than politics, tradition, or theological dogma. They understood and then prophetically proclaimed the singular theme that really underlies each of our purposes and principles. To deny anyone wholeness in terms of life, liberty, or love is to diminish us all. To deny anyone wholeness in terms of life, liberty, or love is to diminish each one of us. All human beings desire wholeness, and that should be the aim of society. Human well-being, flourishing, not wealth or power. And wholeness requires participation in society's decisions. It requires adequate, adequate food, water, and shelter. It requires health care. It requires the right to love who you love, to free speech and free spirituality. And it requires clean, sustainable environments in which to live. And that really covers most of the seven. Most importantly, perhaps, wholeness knows satiety. Knows when enough is enough. Emptiness, ironically, is what primarily propels us towards massive homes and cars and the environmental and emotional impact of our unfortunate quest to possess external space when it is really an interior hole that we seek to fill. When we lack true integrity, when we lack wholeness. <clears throat> and let me be really pretty clear. I am not holding myself out as any kind of model here. I struggle with this too, probably more than many, as Julia would attest, pointing to my ever-expanding collection of hiking gear. <laughs> <clears throat> I know that fear drives much of the behavior that I find most unhealthy in myself. I know that I struggle to live a life of wholeness and to cultivate that in others. <clears throat> In fact, that may be as good a summary as I can articulate regarding the ministry I do to try and inspire and create the conditions in which individuals and communities can live lives of wholeness. Metaphors of wholeness and shape are widely used when we talk about integrity in a broader sense. Someone who is not right is said to be twisted somehow, missing pieces perhaps, a few sandwiches short of a picnic. Not playing with full deck. Two tacos short of a combo plate. <laughs> when we're feeling upset, we might say that we're bent out of shape. And for something to be bent, there must be some kind of force applied. What is it then that makes us less than whole? Which, what compromises our integrity and ultimately our relationships? I would say that there is a particular emotional, psychological, spiritual force that distorts us the most. A feeling that subverts almost everything else and distracts the nobler impulses of the soul out of sometimes quiet, sometimes screaming desperation. In the end, what we constantly struggle against is fear. Fear is what separates us from each other and indeed from ourselves. 
Fear is what bends us out of shape, robs us of completeness. It is the ultimate compromise of our integrity. Fear of the other, fear of losing power, fear of not being enough, fear of, fear of being vulnerable, fear that the universe is against us. Fear keeps us out of sorts, out of shape, out of time, out of place. Think about any time you've lied or compromised your integrity. Fear, I would wager, was at the center of that breach. Fear of punishment, fear of speaking out, fear of insufficiency. Fear of insufficiency, material as much as emotional. When we can move past fear, we step into a brave new world. Dante had to travel all the way through hell and then climb past the devil himself just to get to purgatory, let alone paradise. Rejecting fear helps lead us to a place where we make our choices informed by our strengths and by our reality. I am not saying that there are no risks or dangers in life to be afraid of. Indeed, they are all too real and all too common. The question is, what happens if fear is the primary driver of our choices? Fear was the blunt evolutionary instrument of our ancient animal ancestors who faced immediate physical risks and lacked the prefrontal cortex we all have that allows one to contextualize risk and make judgments, to make different decisions, to move towards that which is difficult, that which we fear. As Rilke wrote, we must trust in what is difficult. And most of our daily fears are no longer inspired by the tiger in the dark, but by the judging gaze of our social group, or the warping effects of a culture obsessed with money and youth. Fear is the whisper in our hearts and heads that makes us ask if we are thin enough, smart enough, rich enough, sexy or sexed enough, masculine enough, feminine enough, talented enough, good enough. Fear is what sabotages relationships as well as our own integrity. Fear sabotages our national integrity on topics like immigration, gay marriage, Sorry, healthcare, military spending, <laughs> privacy, and certainly guns. Mr. Page there. Fear will make us give up on anything or anyone. Fear of lack is what drives greed. Fear that others might have more or better drives economic injustice and our insatiable, insatiable consumerism. Fear that others will snatch up what I need or keep me from living my own life of wholeness drives war and conflict the world over. Fear is far more contagious than any physical disease. The snake in the garden was not evil. It was fear. Fear is what drives us to create mythologies that ultimately create more fear. The emotion of fear itself is not the issue, of course. Everyone feels fear. It only compromises our integrity when we allow it to move us. And unfortunately, one of the directions it tends to move us is away from healthy relationships. I'm trying very hard these days, as a spiritual practice, to pause when I feel stressed, angry, indignant, frustrated, or embarrassed, and ask what feeling is at the center of the experience. And it is almost always fear, if I dig deep enough. A lack of wholeness is part of what ruins relationships. At some deep level, we know that we must have good boundaries, be individuals, be whole in and of ourselves. When one or both partners or the overall family system doesn't allow for this development of individual wholeness, the system weakens. The individuals struggle and lash out Relationships are broken, all integrity eventually lost. And it doesn't have to be this dramatic. Indeed, it often isn't. 
Fear isn't just a ravening monster that devours all in its path. Fear is also the thousand and one ducks that slowly peck us to death. A friend recently reposted a list of tidbits he'd seen about good relationships. There's a million of these and I tend to ignore them. But, you know, this particular friend's a really smart guy, he's a union psychologist, so I figured I'd take a look. Many were common suggestions, but one stood out. Relationships are not a cure for loneliness. How many folks have seen the movie Jerry Maguire? Right, fair enough. Tom Cruise's character famously walks in during the last scene, looks at Renee Zellweger soulfully and says, you complete, complete me. me. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sweet sentiment. But what does it say for his integrity, his own wholeness? I don't want to make too much out of what's generally an enjoyable movie. But I think about the failed relationships of my own past and about some of the couples that I've worked with as they prepared for marriage. The strongest relationships are not the ones in which each completes the other. The best relationships are the ones where each protects and nourishes the growth of the other, the wholeness of the other, stands guardian over the solitude of the other, as Tim read, to help the other find their integrity. I know some of this firsthand. I grew up in a family that had few boundaries, didn't understand healthy relationship, and focused way too much on acquisition and intellectual accomplishment. It has taken me years of therapy and self-work, even to understand the tremendous gaps that I still struggle with. And of course, we all too often seek out communities that simply match up with our own gaps, our own neuroses. I remember confiding in a professor when I was at Boston University working on my PhD. Nervously, I told him that I was leaving academia for ministry. He told me in surprisingly strong words that I would never be happy anywhere else. He insisted that I was an academic at heart. That was my true home. At the time, I was terrified that he was right. He wasn't. Truth is, I was quite unhappy in academia for many reasons, and it was the move to ministry that allowed me to actually turn towards a path of wholeness. But it was hard and frightening to abandon the doctoral studies that I had spent most of a decade on. Wholeness takes courage. And although we've mostly visited this from a Western perspective in terms of Greek philosophy and Dante, the sense of integrity lies at the root of various philosophical and spiritual systems. The Chinese classic, the Tao Te Ching, can be translated as the way of integrity. And De, that middle word, why difficult to translate, may also be interpreted as power or virtue. Integrity serves well, though, and points to a central element of philosophical Taoism, the concept of power through flexibility and adaptability. The 22nd chapter of that book speaks to this. It says, if you want to become whole, first let yourself be broken. If you want to become straight, first let yourself be bent. If you want to become full, first let yourself become empty. Those whose desires are few, get them. Those whose desires are great go astray. For this reason, the Master embraces the Tao as an example for the world to follow. Because she isn't self-centered, people can see the light in her. Because he does not boast of himself, he becomes a shining example. When the ancients said, if you want to become whole, then first let yourself be broken, they weren't using empty words. All who do this will be made complete. Again, the concept of wholeness in relationship to integrity. All who do this will be made complete. And this might seem like a contradiction. On one hand, I'm saying not to yield to fear. And here I am elevating a text that tells us, if you want to become whole, first let yourself be broken. But being broken is not the same as lacking integrity. And the Chinese philosophers understood this. We only lose integrity in brokenness when we refuse to see it or admit it. A lack of integrity 
a lack of wholeness is notoriously hard to escape. It reminds me of the old Sufi story about a servant who runs into the angel of death in a Baghdad market. Death gestures towards the man who runs away terrified. The servant goes to his master and begs for a horse. He rides fast as he can to get far away from Baghdad and the menacing angel. He rides all day and all night to the distant city of Samara, and once there he feels safe. The merchant, curious as to what actually transpired, goes to the market, finds the angel, and questions him. The angel of death apologizes, saying, I didn't mean to scare the poor fellow. I was just so surprised to run into him here in Baghdad, since I have an appointment with him tomorrow morning in Samara. <laughs> Our culture provides us a million ways to distract ourselves from the challenging work of wholeness and justice. We have created entire industries, cities even, aimed at filling that void. And we too often pathologize and then medicate the anxiety and depression that comes from this lack of wholeness and the compromised relationships it leads to. Look at what people will do to their bodies with chemicals and surgeries to defy the reality of time. Look at what people will believe in an effort to fill the void. But no Botox or facelift, no black and white theology or bank account will give you a sense of completeness. We preserve our wholeness when we are honest about where we are broken. And in this honesty, in this humility, we connect with our power and our ability to change. One nuance of meaning that gets lost in translating day, the Chinese concept of virtue, is the animistic quality, the sense of the word that speaks to the inherent spirit or power that imbues the natural world. The mountains, the oceans, the forests, the deserts, and the rivers, and certainly the animals, all have their own integrity, their own innate state of wholeness. When our own integrity is compromised, when we are not able to contain ourselves, we spill out into the natural world, disrupting the integrity found there. How else can we understand the deforestation, the pollution of the oceans, the extinction of life, except in terms of some serious breach of integrity, some lack within us that drives us to disrupt the natural world and as a species, lar species largely ignore the integrity of the earth. We live in concentric circles, like Dante's imaginings. Circles of relationship. The inmost, our relationship with ourselves, the next, the circle of our families, and so on, progressively outward to community, country, planet. I don't have to go all the way back to a poet now dead 693 years to find images of circles, but it's not just the geometry. It's the fact that the inhabitants of Dante's realms are where they are because of the choices they made in life. Those suffering in hell were those who had in some way or another what, had what Dante considered disordered appetites. They turned away from wholeness and followed a narrower, backwards, usually fearful path. How often do we engage in behaviors that wind up nibbling away at the edges of our own wholeness? We turn away from the path we know to be right. How often do we inhabit hells of our own creation? I have borne witness to many forms of suffering over my years as a chaplain, but without doubt, the people whose suffering feels most intense and most resistant to palliation, to improvement, are those who are suffering in emotional and spiritual pain of their own devising. Wholeness requires space to assume one's full shape. This is the process of becoming an adult, learning the shape of one's whole being, and then striving to live into that form. In relationships, then, we ought to listen deeply, to watch closely, to see the healthy shape that those closest to us are seeking to fulfill, and then support them in that growth. I see already some of the outlines of my son Ben's growth, and I see myself struggling at times to allow that shape to expand beyond the bounds that I've grown comfortable with. 
to let go of the baby, let go of the toddler, and create room for the boy who is already inevitably moving towards individuation and adulthood. What I seek as a parent, perhaps more than any other thing, even more than sleeping. <laughs> or five minutes in the bathroom alone. <laughs> is to be brave enough to have integrity enough in myself somehow to allow that same in my child. So as we leave this place, the question before each of us is how are we going to live with more integrity? How are we as individuals, as a society, as a spiritual community going to live in ways that fosters wholeness for ourselves and those around us? How are we going to strive for this in all of our relationships? How are we going to live our lives and these relationships with wholeness and with integrity? In Dante's vision of heaven, the end of the whole poem, his final moments have him circling the divine presence, moved not by money, power, or fear, but as Aristotle suggested 2,300 years ago. By la che move il sol altra stella. I can't read the time. Should have even tried. <laughs> what that means is Dante sees himself being moved by the love, the love that moves the sun and the other stars. Love, not fear, is what will move us towards wholeness in relationships, in all things. Move us towards the good life and towards integrity. Blessed be, namaste, and amen. Our closing hymn, I think we can remain seated, is number 1011 in your teal hymnal, Return Again.